I've been a little horrified to realize that I've been teaching theater and directing theater for over 22 years. In that time, I've been lucky enough to make theatre with a wide variety of different age ranges and in some very, very unusual places. I've had the privilege of making theatre with elders with dementia, with men living in prisons in the UK and Malta, in a rainforest in Costa Rica with an indigenous community, uh, with youth theatres in London, a homeless shelter for youth uh, in New York. I've made theatre with... Uh, people living in um, pupil referral units in the home counties, and with children and teachers on the streets and in schools of India, and with students here in the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama. As a first in family child to go to university, whose dyslexia was only discovered while she was doing her MA, um, and who still struggles to remember her alphabet, let alone her TED lines, who was told as a child that a performing arts was not a serious career path, I'm really grateful for each and every one of these experiences and what I've learnt and am still learning on this journey. Over recent years, the same time as being cut from the school's curriculum, theatre, along with other art subjects, are being asked to do a lot of things by the government and by NGOs. Theatre is asked to examine, to change, to uh, critique, to make people rethink their cultural values, to challenge and question global issues, national issues, and individual issues. It's asked to cure problems like global warming, uh, eating disorders, addiction, health and well-being issues, and on and on and on. The list just never stops. In fact, working in applied theatre recently has started to feel much like I would imagine a nurse feels when they're asked to cure the plague with an itty-bitty sticky plaster. Over the many years that I've worked in the performing arts, the funding policies and the um, funding streams that, that look after this work have changed greatly. The things I've called, defined and named the work have also changed a great deal. At the moment, I'm calling what I do applied theatre or applied theatre arts. Reflecting on this long history makes me feel scarily old, but at the same time realise two things in all of this time haven't changed for me. Firstly, I'm troubled by the intention to change people that's often a focus of the work. And secondly, I'm increasingly aware that despite this unease, what underpins my practice is an ethos of hope. When I'm at a party or in the pub, the question I hate the most, and it is always the question, is what do you do? Um, Trying to describe that you work in theatre is hard. You get the response, oh, you're an actor. Nope, nope, I'm not an actor, no. I'm not a director, no. I'm not a writer. I use theatre to educate. It's not quite right. I use theatre to build self-esteem. Nope. I use theatre to raise aspirational thinking. I cheat. I tell them I'm a teacher. It's invariably followed by, but what do you teach? <laughs> Recently, I've been thinking about what I do as a pedagogy of utopia. So it's hard enough to describe the fact that I'm a teacher of applied theater without now adding the word utopia into the conversation. Because if I talk about utopia, that just means I'm an airy-fairy, hippie, aging hippie dippy who lives in a world of unicorns and rainbows. Using the word utopia makes me feel very uncomfortable. Utopia is a word that's fallen into disrepute and one that's often dismissed as an ideally, idealistic, naive concept that's reserved for daydreamers, or worse, dictators. Danish sociologist Michael Jacobson says that utopia is a um, stubbornly persistent thing that's, that's presently not popular but won't go away because of its persistence. And so it feels like Utopia and I should be very good friends because if there's one thing I am, it's stubbornly persistent, particularly about the value of theatre outside of theatre buildings. So here I want to reclaim the word Utopia and see if theatre can change the world. I like to use a, a definition of Utopia from a French philosopher, Paul Ricoeur. 
He says that the utopia doesn't mean the hope of a better place, but the ability to stand in the current, to appraise reality, and change things. He says that it's not just a dream, but it's a dream that wants to be realized. And so in a pedagogy of utopia, I'm stealing, maybe borrowing, Ricoeur's notion that utopia holds within it a sense of realization. And in that realization, change becomes possible. That isn't to say that the intention of applied theatre is to make change happen. But for me, the intention might be for the people I work with, the people I make theatre with, to see that ch there is the potential to create change, that change is possible. Or as Ricoeur might say, that it creates the field of the possible, a place where you can examine what is in order to see what might be. In other words, utopia contains within it a sense of anticipation, the not yet, the what might be. And if you can see what might be or what isn't yet, then you can create the possibility of change. Ricoeur would say that utopias create moments of distance that allow people to stand outside of their current circumstances and look critically at what exists. So a utopia allows you to look at the world with new eyes and then what you see becomes strange. Usually, people say that they can't change and that things can't be done differently. Certainly, the young people I work with in New York, India, London and the home campus all say that change isn't possible, that, that life is just the way it is. You can't change it. There are no alternatives. Ricoeur would describe that as being encircled in ideology, the things we take for granted, the things as being normal. In fact, he would say that we're trapped in ideology's tornado. I like to think of it as ideology's slinky. But perhaps that's because I'm a child of the 70s. While my slinky is closed around me, I can only see what's within its circle, the status quo. No, I'm not still in the 70s, not the rock band. <laughs> Definitely not. The things that we take for granted. When the, slinks, when the slink is closed, we're encircled by those things that we see as normal, our given circumstances, and we tend to think those can't change. You can't change what you can't see, and the slinky blocks our view of reality. But if we can gain a distance from that steel cage of normality, we might gain a better perspective, and we might be able to see that the things we take for granted can change. By creating gaps in the slinky, we can see the slinky itself, the cage, and beyond it. So we're stretching the ideological circle. The gaps allow for reflection on what is, and once we can see what is, we can start to think about ways to do things differently, and change becomes possible. So my suggestion is that th making theatre creates gaps where it's possible to see reality at a distance and imagine a different way of living. Or in other words, theatre becomes a space for imagining different futures. So, a utopia might be triggered while working with inmates of a prison as they create a piece of theatre for their families. This is a project that I've worked on more or less annually since 2004. Each year, a group of British or Maltese men in prison who are new to the prison system and who are fathers with very young children come together over a two-week period to devise, create, and perform a piece of children's theatre. At the end of the rehearsal process, the children of the families of the men are invited into the prison to see that performance. As I'm sure you can imagine, being a father in prison and having children outside that prison makes it very difficult to maintain family relationships. The project, whilst acknowledging the damage that a prison sentence does to parent-child relationships, allows the fathers to concentrate on their children and demonstrate that they're serious about creating something for them as a gift. In the children's play project, the fathers create a play amidst a great deal of laughter. They also talk about their current circumstances and what they want or anticipate for their futures. Throughout the project, the men reflect on their life in prison and how it feels to be a father on the inside with children on the outside. In these moments, they critique what is and plan for what might be. The men often talk about how they want to be better fathers, how they want to be available for their children, and some of them link this directly to wanting to stay crime-free and out of prison in the future. For these men in this project, those moments are where the utopia, I think, can be glimpsed. 
So a pedagogy of utopia allows people to see their current situation clearly and to imagine different ways by questioning what different ways of living by questioning what their life is. The children's play project presents men, the men involved with an opportunity to show that they want to change and that they can actively participate in their children's lives. It's nice to have a child participating while we're, while we're doing this. As the fathers work, they focus on their children. During the rehearsal process as a group, we make invites that feature the characters of the play that the men post to their children. The men share stories with their children on the telephone and they share those stories with us in the rehearsal process. They talk about how the project has become a focus for communication with their kids. Their children want to know what character their dad will play and what costume he'll be wearing. The dance number always becomes a bit of a focus of amusement with the men's partners not quite being able to, learn, to believe that they're learning to dance. Um, and that part of the process becomes particularly difficult because making theatre is hard. The rehearsal process, like change, is also hard. The men struggle with their lines, much like I have struggled with mine today. Um, and they particularly struggle with that dance number. After all, they're adult men who aren't trained as professional dancers, and we're suddenly asking them to perform like a boy band and sing and dance in a synchronized manner. As the day of the performance grows closer, they work especially hard to get that bit right. They often come into the rehearsal process in the morning talking about how they've practiced the dance number in their cells or on the wing the night before because they want to get it right for their children. And in each year that we've run this project, that's become a constant refrain. The men tell us that it's hard, it's difficult, but they want to get it right because it's for their kids. They keep going and stick with it and re reach the end performance because it's for their kids. One inmate who wanted to play the part of Captain Mac, <laughs> shiver my timbers, Captain Mac, petitioned to get that role, particularly because his son was obsessed, his six-year-old son was obsessed with pirates. So he told his son that he was going to be a pirate, but he kept it a secret that he was the captain of the pirate gang. During the rehearsal process, unlike me, he perfected his pirate accent. And he even went to the library to learn authentic pirate slang. <laughs> After the show, he told us how his son's face just lit up when he realized that his dad was the chief pirate. And he said that this father said that it was an opportunity to show his father, uh, show his children and his family that I'm here, I'm in prison, I've done something wrong. But I'm not just wasting my time serving my time. I'm trying to do something good. I'm trying to do something positive. And his son's reaction made all the hard work worthwhile. There are many moments and anecdotes during this work that I could share with you that start to show the hope in this work for me. The feminist theorist, Bell Hooks, tells us that hope emerges when we see individuals struggle to, to positively transform their lives. And working on this project, I watch men struggle. I watch them struggle to get the play right. I, get, I see them struggle to be fathers while their children are outside. I see them struggle with their day-to-day -day lives and with their past and with the crimes that they've committed. But while they're doing that, I also see them attempting to make changes for their future. They want to be better fathers. And some of them can see those changes as a reality while they're working on this project. They envisage different futures for themselves. No, I'm not back in a naive world of unicorns, even though I do have some rainbow, rainbow colors in my hair. I'm very aware that wanting change doesn't make it happen. But during this process, these men are committed to the idea of change. They believe that change is possible and that things don't have to stay the same for them. So a pedagogy of utopia or an applied theatre practice confronts the challenge of creating a better future by exploring and questioning the social reality that exists and, challenges th and challenging that assumption that things can't change. It's a theatre practice that examines what is while paving the way for what is not yet. One participant who worked on the project told us about his two-year-old daughter. In her life, he'd only managed to spend 12 weeks living with her in the same house because of his prison sentences. He told us that he didn't class himself as a dad, that he didn't really think he could be a dad because he hadn't spent any time with her. 
and that this play had started to change that. He said that the play had demonstrated that he could have a relationship with her and proved to him that he wanted to do that and that he could give something back. He told us, she's only young now. I don't want her not to have a dad like I didn't have. I want things to be different for her and I want to be there for her. As part of this play process, he started to build a relationship with his daughter and could begin to see a role for, his l for himself in her life if he could stop committing crime and avoid going back to prison. Does theatre change the world? Probably not. But it can change the world for individuals. These plays have contributed to positive consequences for the men who took part in them. Some confessed to not making the changes that they wanted to. One was released from prison to commit a further crime, be reincarcerated, and was back serving a new sentence in exactly the same prison where we met him the previous year. But others have gone on to further education courses. Some have transferred to training prisons. Several have been released and are working for performing arts companies or, God forbid, other types of career paths. <laughs> One has set up a media... Um, a media filming company that makes training videos for industry. Many are making long-term changes to their lives. And at the very least, each of these men has had a moment of success. A moment of success that's been witnessed by each other, prison guards, friends, families, and complete strangers. And that moment of success can be very precious and a potentially life-changing moment. Making theatre's not easy. Making theatre demands hard work, technical skills, collaboration. Arts projects that have concrete goals develop self-esteem, communication skills, confidence, empathy, self-awareness, control, and these things can be the gateway to a different future. Making theatre can help develop positive relationships. I know it's not a guaranteed route to change and positive life chances, but surely all people deserve the right to express their creativity, to access the arts, to access theatre, to dream, and to make that dream a potential possibility. So maybe theatre doesn't change the world. Maybe it can change the world for some of us and some individuals. Just as it changed the world for the shy, introverted, dyslexic, and socially awkward teenager you see stood before you today as Dr. Busby, an applied theatre academic, and who's now asking you, can theatre change your world?